Welcome to the Plant Trainers Podcast, where we're helping people improve their quality of life through nutrition and fitness. And now, your hosts, nutrition and wellness coaches, international speakers, Adam and Shoshana Chaim. Hey, I'm Adam Chaim. And I'm Shoshana Chaim, and we are Propelled, Propelled by Plants. Plants. Today, we bring to you episode 250, Food is the Solution, What to Eat to Save the World with Matthew Prescott. In today's episode of the Plant Trainers Podcast, we talk to the extremely intelligent Matthew Prescott about what to eat to save the world and the social and environmental issues associated with the current food production system. There's a grave issue on our planet, but there's also a solution, food. We, as a society, have been trained to look away from when our needs have a negative effect on the environment. This causes individuals to make up or repeat statements like, we'll never run out of clean water, or it takes more land to grow plants for humans than it does to raise cattle for food. So today we get to the bottom of these myths, allowing humans to have more intelligent and fact-driven conversations about the state of our planet and the food on our plate. Our hope is that it will allow the masses to make more informed decisions about what's going on the end of their forks, knowing the impact it's having on local and global levels as well. Please press pause and share this podcast on social media right now, as this issue does not only affect you, but your children and grandchildren. Matthew Prescott is the author of Food is a Solution, What to Eat to Save the World. He's an advisor to the Good Food Institute, Senior Director of Food and Agriculture for the Humane Society of the United States, and a leading figure in the global movement to reform how we farm and eat. A sought-after speaker and thought leader, Matthew has spent over a decade and a half sharing his ideas with Ivy League universities, Fortune 500 companies, consumers, and more. His work has helped lead to sweeping changes in the supply chains of hundreds of major food companies, impacted countless individuals' diets, and has been covered extensively by the media. His work has been featured by CNN, in the pages of New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, USA Today, The Boston Globe, and countless others. He's been published in Fortune Magazine, The Washington Post, Barron's, and more. And he was even once a guest on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. He lives in Austin, Texas with his wife, the writer Lara Prescott. Hey patrons, we wanted to give you an extra shout out and tell you we appreciate how much you care. Because of your contributions, no matter how big or small, you've helped us to cover hosting and production costs, as well as give a bright young intern a chance to work with our compassionate company. And for those of you who contributed in 2017, you should know that some of those funds went to help support the Storybook Farm Primate Sanctuary here in Ontario. For those of you who want to help support the show, support learning opportunities for young plant-based students and compassionate causes, you can do so at patreon.com slash plant trainers or click the link in the show notes. And now for a moment of gratitude. I'm grateful for that crazy weekend that we had in April where it hailed for 48 hours straight followed by freezing rain, not because of the weather so much, but because it forced the family together on a weekend with nothing else to do And we ended up watching Okja, which was extremely powerful. If you have young children, I don't necessarily recommend it for them because there is a lot of swearing and there is some powerful, powerful scenes. However, we did watch it as a family and I really am grateful to have that opportunity to talk our children through what was happening. I'm grateful for the amount of interaction we've been having on our Instagram account and people sending us direct messages and communicating with us and commenting and It's really cool to be able to reach more people and build relationships with them. Matthew Prescott, thank you so much for joining us on the Plant Trainers podcast today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. We wanted to know if you have a moment of gratitude to share with us and our listeners. You know, I was grateful recently. I gave a a talk out in Los Angeles and both my mother and my sister traveled all the way from their home in New England out to Los Angeles just to cheer me on at this talk. And I was really grateful to have such great cheerleaders uh, who are willing to fly across the country to uh, to help me out. So that's my that's the thing I'm grateful for today the most. That's beautiful. It's always more meaningful when you have your family in the audience. I know Adam and I had our family in the audience in September when we spoke here at the Toronto Veg Food Festival. And it, it kind of brings a different feeling to it. 
Yeah, definitely. It was nice to be able to share it with them. And I snuck in some photos of them into my presentation, which they didn't know I was going to do in advance. And so I had a little surprise in there for them. (laughs) That's quite funny. So we're really, really impressed with your new book, Food is the Solution, What to Eat to Save the World. And it's not only an extremely powerful book in terms of the language and what you've conveyed through the writing, but it's also quite beautiful. And I think you've done a really good job at adding so many recipes that people will want it as a cookbook, but there's so much to learn in terms of the environment in there as well. Yeah, you know, I I wanted to produce a cookbook chiefly, um, but as I got into it, I thought, you know, I've got so much to say on this topic of the impact that food has on the environment, I'm just going to kind of divide it up. And so I kind of refer to the book as like half manifesto, half cookbook, um, with, of course, the first portion being, you know, kind of a visual representation told through infographics and environmental photography and investigative reporting about how what we eat impacts the world around us. And then, you know, once the reader hopefully learns a little bit about that topic, they can dive right into the recipes. They can dive right into making a difference through the 80 recipes that are provided in the second half of the book. Yeah, there's there's really no guesswork there. Or they could start with the recipes and then kind of say, hmm, what's this beginning part I skipped over and really learn some information that they haven't necessarily picked up on before. Or maybe they've heard once or twice and didn't quite believe or didn't quite register because... I know that part of the problem for a lot of people is that when they're talking to other people, and I'm not saying arguing with with omnivores, but when they're talking to other people who are legitimately asking questions about the environment and everybody doesn't have, you know, specific enough answers to really feel confident to have that conversation, to make an argument, not have an argument, but make an argument. So I, I think that there's a lot of information there. And I think that there's a lot that we can clear up here also on the podcast and a lot of the questions that I prepared in advance, I sent you some talking points as I do Mm -hmm. with all of our, all of our guests, which I don't normally talk about, but as Adam was looking through them and he's like, shush, there's a lot of questions about water. And I'm like, I'm just obsessed about water. And it seems to be a really hot topic lately because there seems to be a lot of rebuttals that I wanted to be able to clear up here with you as well, because I think a lot of the listeners will learn a lot from that. All right, the pressure is on. I hope I can help clear it up. <laughs> Hang well, on, but before yeah. before you actually get to those questions, Matt, how do you how does somebody get into this kind of field? Like, how did you get so interested in figuring out how to solve the world's problem with the environment being a major in a major state of emergency, so to speak? Like, how did you get to that? Well, you know, so my story starts back when I was just a teenager. I think I don't even think I was a teenager yet. I think I was about 12 years old. And my sister came home from school one day and she just kind of proclaimed herself a vegetarian. I guess she learned something about meat production in science class that didn't sit well with her. She wanted to have nothing to do with it. And she said, I'm a vegetarian now. And I'd never even heard the word before, let alone met a vegetarian. And I, I didn't know what to make of it. But, you know, eventually I did learn more and more about the reasons for her diet. And I tried some of this incredibly delicious, you know, to my surprise, vegetarian food that, you know, my mother was making for her. And I, too, moved in that direction. And I learned really quickly that the that so many social issues that impact our world, that impact the planet environmentally, that impact um, you know, our sense of humanity in terms of our own ethics that impact animals, of course, that impact our own health, they all intersect around what we eat. And specifically, they all intersect around livestock production and eating meat. And so this book is really an attempt to show that intersection and to show how if we want to solve so many pressing crises in our world, environmental crises, health crises, and so on, the thing we really ought to be doing is eating, at the very least, less plants and more meat. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the reverse of that, less meat and more plants. This was about to be a really interesting interview if I had that argument to make. Um, if we have editing uh, capabilities. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, it's to, to eat less meat and more plants. And, uh, you know, it just comes from years of, of learning about these intersections and learning about how, you know, the number one thing we can all do to save the planet is just to put more plants on our plates. Yeah, and I, one of the things that I talk about when I do my talks to to cl- groups of people is I talk about how the food that we consume has a tremendous impact on our body and how we perform. And I think what you've done here is you're taking it one step further. And on the back of your book, you actually wrote, 
the food we eat can harm or heal the world. And I use something similar, harm or heal our personal body. But you've taken it one step further and you're talking about how it's making an impact on our planet, which is very powerful. And that's, I guess, what we're going to get into during this talk. I think it's very cyclical also, right? Because if we're harming the environment, we're harming our world, it's in fact harming our bodies as well. Absolutely. And, you know, at the end of the day, we if we want to solve, you know, the global health crisis, we're here in North America, you know, say just the obesity epidemic or skyrocketing rates of heart disease. Say we want to solve cruelty to animals on factory farms or in other areas. We have to first solve our environmental problems because we need a world in which to live if we want to try to make it better. There's got to be a world there to begin with. And, you know, at the rate that our climate is changing, at the rate that we're suffering from extreme weather patterns and drought and all these other problems, and we just have to fix that first before we can look at these other areas. It just so happens that by addressing it through diet and through a plant-based diet, we can actually address all the areas simultaneously. So it's a win-win for everybody. So I, I think what people need to hear is how the water is really being affected, because I know that there has been fear before of running out of water in the world. And then there has been, well, we, we have so much water that it could never go away, right? North Pole, South Pole, what have you, or it's filled with water and, you know, icebergs and all of that. Well, the icebergs are melting, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, but, but the water will never go away. And then I've also heard that if water is being evaporated into the sky, it will return and it will fall again. So we will never actually run out of water. But will we run out of clean water? Will we run out of water that is actually sustainable for us or that will help us sustain? So what do you have to say about that? Yeah, you know, I mean, 70 percent of the Earth's surface is water. And so I know it's easy to think, oh, we've got plenty of that stuff to go around. Um, But we are running out of fresh water. Globally, the demand for fresh water is projected to increase by 55 percent just before 2050. And much of that demand is driven by agriculture, which accounts for, you know, 70 percent of all fresh water use on the planet. There was a study done by NASA into um, basically global fresh water sources And what they found is that all the world's freshwater sources are being drained faster than they're being replenished. So of all the world's major aquifers, 21, I think, out of 37 are receding, whether you look at India or China or the United States or France. Our freshwater sources are are, um, receding faster than they're being replenished. And so we've absolutely got to start conserving water. You know, we've got a growing population. And the way that we're using it now is just so irresponsible. You know, it takes 53 gallons of water to produce one single egg. A pound of pork, I think, is 500 gallons. Cheese is 50 gallons of water. You know, we're funneling all of these resources. We're growing all of these crops and funneling them through animals to get to protein rather than just using the protein that's already in plants, which would be much more resource efficient. And as our population grows as then our water continues, de- you know, depleting, we've got to find more responsible ways of, of using what we have and doing more with less, which brings us back to plant-based foods. Um, that's this definitely the solution to solving the problem. So that's water usage. Then you talk about water quality and, you know, all the runoff from factory farms is destroying, you know, rivers and tributaries and other sources of water. People who live near these places report that when they turn on their faucets, they get, you know, animal feces coming out of their bathtubs and their kitchen sinks. It's a, it's a major problem. And, you know, plant-based foods are definitely the solution to that problem. Yeah, I love the stories that you tell in the book because you talk about these individuals, not just as the masses, but actual individual people with their own stories who are, who are going through these problems. And what about the idea of, well, we have water cleaning facilities that clean the water. So if we're taking a shower that's 10 minutes instead of five minutes, that's OK. The city will just clean it for us. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's definitely true. But, you know, there's so much resources that go into all aspects. I mean, there's everything that we do has an impact. There's resources that go into everything we do, whether it's growing crops or raising animals or treating water. And the, I mean, there's so much resources that go into everything we do. And part of my goal with this book is to show that if we want to conserve resources, say all the energy it takes to run water treatment facilities, we want to conserve land, the land that those facilities sit on. We want to conserve land, you know, agricultural land. The best thing that we can do is to shift toward a plant-based diet because all around it's just so much less resource intensive. 
there are people that are probably thinking, they're probably not the people listening to this show, but there are people that say, you know, I have bigger things to worry about, like myself, my personal health, and I don't have the time, the energy to think about the animals and the environment. I need to take care of me. How do you respond to those kind of people who are, I guess, selfish in some ways, but the truth is, if they're not healthy, then they're not doing anybody any good anyway. So they have to look at themselves as the priority. Yeah, I would say two things. I would say to those people, number one, the best thing you can possibly do for yourself health-wise is to eat plant-based foods. You know, our biggest killers, at least in North America, are heart disease, stroke, and cancer. And all of the scientific studies show that those are directly correlated to eating too much meat, dairy, and eggs. You know, cholesterol, for example, clogs our arteries. If, they, if it clogs our arteries to our brain, we can suffer a stroke. If it clogs our arteries to our hearts, we have a heart attack. And cholesterol only comes from animal proteins. It's only made in animals. Plant-based foods naturally have zero cholesterol. And so if you're just chiefly concerned about clearing your arteries up, preventing heart disease, preventing stroke, or preventing cancer, I say eat more plant-based foods. The other, I think, self-interested reason to eat more plant-based vegan foods is just from a taste perspective. You know, before I became vegan, I was kind of closed off culinarily speaking. You know, I was a real meat and potatoes kind of kid and I ate the same thing, you know, pretty much day in and day out. I would always get a sausage pizza uh, if I got pizza. I would always get, you know, chicken parmesan if I was getting a sandwich. And I didn't really try new foods. It wasn't until became, I became vegan that I thought, oh, there's this whole array of really delicious foods out there that forget the ethics behind them. They're just good foods. You know, tofu in Chinese food is wonderful by all accounts. Nutritional yeast on popcorn is incredible. Whether you're a vegan or not, you can appreciate that. And, you know, cauliflower buffalo wings are great. Again, whether you're a vegan or not. And so, I, you know, just from a purely selfish standpoint, I say try some of these foods. People, you know, meat eaters out there who are, are self-interested um, because you might just find that you've discovered new foods that you love. I think you also have to take the time to realize what is happening with the foods that you are eating, too, and how is that affecting you? And if you want to be selfish about your own body, your own health, your own time that you're spending in doctor's offices, by supporting the pork industry, you're allowing either the blood from the animals or the stool from the animals to run into the oceans or to run into the lakes. And then that's infecting the waters, the plants, the fish. And then those fish are being harvested for your dinner plate. And then you're eating that that's been sitting and saturating and marinating in other animals' extremities. Is that the right word? People don't want to hear this stuff, though. They don't yeah. want to know about this. But I, I think I think that it's selfish not to. And it's selfish not just for the whole entire world, it's selfish for you. And then it's selfish for your children and for your spouses and for your families, because people are getting sick. People are getting sick. People are getting salmonella poisoning. People are, are eating foods that have seriously been sitting in the animal's feces. And if you think about it, if you were out eating a sandwich or eating an apple and walking your dog and your apple fell on the ground, even close to where your dog may have gone to the bathroom, you wouldn't just go home and rinse it off and eat it anyway. You wouldn't think of eating that. Yeah. And this is why, you know, the chicken industry, for example, pumps, you know, chicken meat full of chlorine to try to kill off some of these um, pathogens. It's why, you know, meat, raw meat comes with, you know, very bold, clear cooking instructions about cooking, you know, cleaning it and then cooking it in a clean, safe environment and cooking it well enough. We shouldn't have to do that with food. We should be able to eat it you know, raw or close to raw if we want to without the fear of getting some kind of foodborne illness. And, you know, of course, I mean, you can get food sickness from eating vegan food as well. Spinach can have E. coli on it, you know, if it's sprayed with manure, for example, and, and not cleaned properly. But the incidence of foodborne illness and pathogens from meat and dairy and eggs is so remarkably high you know, virtually 100% of chicken now has fecal contamination on it when it gets to your home. So, you know, we're, I, I know I know a lot of people who have come to vegetarian eating or vegan eating, whether in full or in part, through food safety concerns, through, through thinking, you know, I don't want to eat something that has poop on it. 
Yeah. Don't we don't eat poop. No. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Insert poop emoji here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I love talking about poop on the podcast, but I'll move on. Um, so there's lots of vegetarians out there who have even given up dairy because they recognize the effects of dairy on their body. They uh, recognize what it is that they're actually eating when they eat dairy. However, fish and salmon in particular seems to be something that lingers on. So what message do we have for the salmon eating folks that are ready to hear that message to be able to give it up? What effect is it having on either their health or the environment? We're taking a short break to let you know that this episode of the Plant Trainers podcast is sponsored by Legrand Power of Plants. They are a Quebec-based company that prepares fresh plants into ready-to-eat meals and condiments to promote and facilitate a healthy and balanced lifestyle. You know that the benefits of a plant-based diet can improve your blood pressure, decrease heart disease, lower cholesterol, and better control weight, but it can be hard preparing every meal from scratch. That's why we're so glad that Legrand products have made their way into Ontario and parts of the United States. They have products we trust at our own dinner table and offer high-quality ingredients and nutrients that even kids enjoy. Their pastas, sauces, pestos, soups, and chilies are some of the best out there and allow families to get back to the healthy dinner table again. Legrand's products are a bridge to a clean, real food eating way of life by harnessing the power of plants every day so you can experience your full vitality. Check out the link in the show notes or visit legrandpoweroflants.com to find out where these products are sold near you. You can also ask your local health food store about carrying their soups, chilies, sauces, and pestos. And now back to the show. Yeah, you know, I was really, it was really remarkable when I was, while I was researching this book to learn a little bit more about fish farming and also wild caught fishing practices. Fish farming, for example, salmon farming is extraordinarily detrimental to the environment. Um, for one thing, and it's a little bit of a tongue twister here, but farmed fish may eat more fish than the fish on the farm. So I'm just making this number up. Say you have 10 fish on a salmon farm, they may eat as their food 20 fish caught in the ocean. So by eating even farmed salmon or any kind of farmed fish, one is contributing not only to the problems associated with fish farming, but also the problems associated with catching fish in the wild, which includes you know, dragging nets many miles along behind a ship to dredge up anything in its wake, whether you know, the fish they're trying to catch or coral reefs or sea turtles or porpoises or any other kind of marine life that may get caught in these nets. In fact, there was an undercover investigation released um, just this week showing in California uh, what the fishing industry looks like, dead sharks and all kinds of other animals caught in these fishing nets. It's just really horrific to think about. Health-wise as well, you know, health experts now realize that, you know, fish is full of cholesterol, fish is full of pathogens, there's evidence that um, tuna, for example, has mercury in it, and that eating too much of it can, can lead to mercury poisoning. You know, plant-based foods are just a safer bet in general. And, you know, one thing that I say in the book, I certainly am vegan. You know, I take it you all are vegan. I take it probably most of your listeners are vegan. But, you know, one point that I make in the book is for people who aren't ready to make that step, just do it slowly. You know, I didn't become vegan or vegetarian overnight. Most people didn't. Just start enjoying more of these foods, you know, see which brands of burgers and, and plant-based milks you like and just start incorporating more of them. I think it's all good. I think there's a seat at the table for everybody when it comes to plant-based eating, regardless of what their diet may be. I agree completely. I was in a meeting today and what the woman told me is that she's not ready to give up fish. She's, you know, given up all of the other animal proteins, but she just doesn't have enough other alternatives to eat to be able to give up fish at this point. And I congratulated her on that because that's where she is in her journey. That's where she needs to go. And clearly there's a plan to try to fill that gap for the fish moving forward. Uh, but look at how much she has gone through already. Look at how much she has given up already. And I think that, ev uh, of course, everybody has their own journey. Everybody needs to do it in their own time. But what we need to do is still know the facts and make that decision to eat the foods or not eat the foods. And again, for the, you know, factory farm fish, <laughs> another tongue twister, fa yeah. factory farmed fish, you know, going back to that apple in the poop, you know, these fish are, are living with poop all around them, right? Oh, yeah, they're living in, in tanks that are just filled with their own waste, um, you know, swimming kind of gill to gill. You know, we say of chickens on a chicken farm, they live wing to wing. Well, farmed fish live gill to gill packed into these tanks. It's just filled with their waste. It's so 
un- have such an unhealthy environment for these fish to live in that fish farmers now just pump antibiotics right into the water. You know, they just pump them in so that the fish can live through these conditions that are so so unhealthy they would otherwise die if it weren't for for that. And so, you know, I say the same thing to people. But, you know, I've had people say to me, oh, I could totally go vegan except for fish or except for bacon. And I always say, great, you know, then go vegan except for fish, except for bacon. I bet that once you explore all of the great plant-based foods that are out there and you start eating more of them, you're not going to have really much of an interest in continuing to eat those other animal products. I think most people, once they realize just how many wonderful vegan products there are out there, they think, why, I don't need to eat this other stuff. Why am I even doing it? You know, you now in America and in Canada and all across, um, you know, the world, you can't turn down a street corner without going into some place that has almond milk and coconut milk and macadamia milk and veggie burgers and tofu and just so many other kinds of foods, you know, that's right at our fingertips. I think it's a big challenge because a lot of we've been marketed to, right? We've been told that we need our protein from milk or our our calcium from milk or protein from meat. We need our omega-3 from fish. We're, We're dealing with these big marketing companies, lots of dollars, And lots of face time that people are getting with these companies and products to try to convince them to stay eating those animal products. And for us to convince them or show them the benefits of or the different ways to get those nutrients, it's a huge challenge. And we're trying to do it one person at a time. And it's going to take a long time. But I don't think the environment and our planet has that much time to wait around for everybody to wake up. So how are we going to be able to get to more people, spread that knowledge, and I don't want to say convert people, but get people to change their lives for the better to help improve themselves and the environment? Well, you know, one thing that I try to, to, I try to think a lot about the impact that we can have on individuals, you know, other consumers, and the impact that we can have on, you know, the food industry. And I think by far the biggest bang for the buck is moving the food industry toward a more plant-based system. And so one thing that I think, you know, I try to do in my own life that I think, you know, a lot of other vegans and vegetarians I know try to do is to support the products that are out there. You know, TGI Fridays, the restaurant chain just added a Beyond Meat burger to all their locations. I say it's an ethical duty for us to go and support it. You know, when Starbucks adds a new vegan milk product, I think we should go and support it. Um, if a grocery store, you know, Target, for example, just added new vegan burgers, Costco added new vegan burgers to their product line, I think we should go and support it. And the reason why I think that is the more these products are some more supported, the more likely the food industry is going to be to invest in more of them because they're going to see that there's a market for it. And I think that that's how things are really going to change quickly is when the food industry sees a market and comes on board and thinks, oh, gosh, you know, I'm just going to let's make more and more plant based products. We've talked about this time and time again, how there's two camps out there. There's a very strong camp saying we need to only support the fully plant-based or the fully vegan companies because they need our support more than anything. And we shouldn't be even supporting the plant-based or vegan sections of regular companies because they sell animal products as well. But, you know, we always keep going back to saying our, our dollars count and we see companies buying plant-based companies we see and I think I think and this is a topic for another day completely but I think with the innovations of clean meat although it doesn't necessarily fall into the category of something that we would be consuming necessarily it's definitely a, a good option for omnivores moving forward where it's a cleaner more sustainable way to grow meat than than what we're doing right now because we're using tons and tons of land just to grow the meat that everybody needs to eat. I mean, you know, there's 8 billion of us and how much space are we taking up per person to be able to grow this meat, you know, and allow it to get as big as it needs to get. And then a lot of people are saying, well, I eat organic meat, which I think in a way is good because or grass fed. Or grass fed yeah, grass fed grass-fed beef, grass-fed chicken, but in a sense, that's even more damaging to the planet because of all of the wetlands and rainforests that are being cut down 
to use for either these grass fed or commercial farmings. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, with regard to clean meat, I, I'm a proponent of it. I think it's great. I've, I've had it before. Some of the sample products that exist out there um, just kind of in private settings. I think uh, I'd be the first one lining up at the grocery store to eat it. I, I don't find anything kind of inherent to the concept of eating tissue or muscle that is off putting to me. What I want to avoid and the reason why I'm vegan is because I want to avoid, you know, the ethical problems of eating those products. And so if there was a way to make actual flesh and tissue and muscle without farming animals, without as much of an environmental impact, potentially with better health implications, sign me up for it. You know, at the same time, there are so many great plant based products already out there that we can already get our hands on. I live in Austin, Texas, which is like vegan heaven. You know, you can't throw a, a stone without hitting a vegan restaurant here in Austin. And I so I go to them all the time. At the same time, you know, companies that aren't vegan that add more vegan products, we got to show them the support. Um, ben and Jerry's started with, I think, four vegan ice cream products when they came out of the gate on that four products made out of almond milk. And now 20% of their product line is vegan because there was so much for support for that product. Silk soy milk, anybody who buys silk soy milk has probably to thank for that, the company called Dean Foods, which is the biggest dairy company in North America. Dean Foods bought White Wave, which produces silk and thrust them into the stratosphere through their distribution channels. That's when Silk, you know, started getting, you know, distributed by every grocery company on the planet after this dairy company bought them. And, um, you know, I think that's the type of progress that I love to see is a dairy company seeing how much profit there can be had by served by selling vegan food. Uh, that That's the way forward to me. Yeah, I think there's profit in the amount of people that are buying it. But I think there's also profit in what it takes for them to be able to create and it's more cost efficient for them to create their product as well. You know, they don't need to have three football fields per person per year to be able to, you know, grow their meat and, and milk their cows. They can just do it in a lab or do it in a facility, right? Yeah, yeah. And in fact, Greg Engels, the former CEO of Dean Foods, again, this is the CEO of one of the biggest dairy companies on the planet. Um, with regard to, to silk soy milk after they bought them, he said that plants will always be a more efficient way to make milk than animals because the cow, he said, is an inefficient converter of grain into milk or grain into meat, if you will. And so, you know, when you've got the CEO of a major dairy company saying plants are more efficient than animals in terms of getting milk into your glass, that's a pretty big step forward. We're growing the plants for the animals to eat, to eat the animals, we could totally wipe out the middleman. Well, exactly. not wipe them out completely, but <laughs> in, in the process of creating food, wipe, wipe yeah. it out. Yeah. Yeah. We could cut out the middleman and, and we do it all the time. You know, industries cut out middlemen all the time to bring better products to us. You know, how many of us get up and drive to a video rental store when we want to watch a movie at home anymore? You know, how many of us get up and drive to a CD store to buy a new CD if we want to listen to, you know, a new album that's hit the shelves? You know, we cut out middlemen all the time and the same is true with food. Another thing that I hear quite often from omnivores is that it would take more land to grow enough produce for everybody than it would to create the meat for everybody. Do you have any ideas or stats on that? Yeah, I think it's it's a ludicrous argument, frankly. Um, I mean, we it takes 20 pounds of, of, you know, 16 to 20 pounds of plants, of produce, to produce one pound of meat. So, you know, I think what people who make that argument are failing to remember is that cows and other farm animals live off of plant matter. Um, you know, they don't just exist in the world and, and not eat. And so if one is concerned about the amount of land it takes to grow plants, by all means, they should adopt a vegan diet because it takes more land to grow all the plants that we feed to animals than it would just to grow plants to eat directly. How many pounds of plants do you assume we eat? Well, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So if I eat a pound of broccoli, it's just a pound of broccoli that's gone to produce it. If I eat a pound of meat, it's you know 20 pounds of plants plus the animal. Right. Got it. Hmm. Good mm, stuff here. It's mind-blowing stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, I think more people are realizing this, um, which is why we've just seen vegan eating taking off in recent years. It used to be that, you know, products like veggie burgers were really just for vegetarians. And now we see even meat eaters, you know, really enjoying this stuff. We see more and more people going vegetarian, going vegan, 
trying meatless Mondays, eating smaller portions of meat, whatever it is, we just see so many people, I think, realizing that the way we're doing it now with the food supply chain and focusing so much on meat just isn't working. We got to find a better way. And then there is a better way. In the book, you talked about your three R's. And when I think of three R's, I think about the kids song where it's, it's dancing, it's talking about reduce, reuse, recycle. But your three R's were a little bit different. And I wanted to know if you could maybe talk to them. Your three R's were reduce, replace, refine. So maybe you can explain that. So, you know, the concept of the three R's is something that a lot of people are doing, which is reducing the amount of meat and other animal products in their diet, replacing those products with plant-based foods, and then refining for those people who do continue eating animal products, at the very least, refining what they eat to avoid factory farm practices. And so that's where you see people, um, you know, who, if they're actually practicing what they say they're practicing, who are vegan other than you know, I'm making this up, but like eggs from their neighbor's chickens or, you know, eggs from some farmer in their town who they know, refining those products to be sure that where the products are coming from are, you know, aligned with them ethically. You know, from my my opinion, you know, I choose to just eat a vegan diet straight up because, you know, I I love the food. I think it's healthier. I think it's more ethically consistent with um, where I want to be personally. But for people who are, you know, set on keeping some animal products in their diet, I think it's a good plan um, for them to for them to try to do. What about the people who are very careful about the animals in which they're eating from. So for example, keeping a coop of chickens in their own backyard so that they know where their eggs are coming from. They don't know what they're being fed. What are the environmental or health problems that could occur just by having those in the more urban areas? Well, I mean, unless we're talking about doing it at a large scale, there probably aren't environmental problems. The health problems are still the same. You may have, you know, less food safety concerns but, you know, an egg is an egg is an egg is an egg in terms of cholesterol and fat content and calories and, and all of the nutrition content. And but, you know, for me, I've thought about, you know, what would I do if I had chickens just as kind of like an ethical uh, riddle, I guess, to solve in my own brain or just a hypothetical. I still land on eating a vegan diet because even if I had chickens in my backyard, I think the better thing to do with the eggs than to eat them would be to give them to neighbors who are buying eggs from the grocery store and therefore reduce the number of of animals in the factory farm system. So if I ever, for some reason, if I ever decide to adopt a chicken and you're my neighbor, you can count on getting those eggs. (laughs) Hmm. Maybe we should buy a house. No, we we, we won't eat them anyway, but that's all right. We wouldn't eat the eggs, but yeah, that's very nice of you. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So what actionable tips do you have today for anybody who might already be plant-based or pretty vegetarian or maybe not at all for starting to make an impact in the environment? Because I think a lot of people think I can't make a difference myself, but it's not true. They can. So where should they start? Yeah. If you're already vegan, you're already vegetarian, you've got a leg up. You're already making a huge impact. I would say the biggest impact that you can make from there is to influence other people. And, and, uh, you know, for me, I've just found in my own experience in my own life with my own, you know, friends and family and neighbors and colleagues, the best way to do that is just to serve as a positive example Um, You know, bring delicious food to potlucks, you know, share recipes with people, share books with people, you know, share documentaries. There are so many, you know, great books and documentaries out there that you can either buy as a gift for somebody or recommend on Netflix. And, you know, I, I think that that's probably the number one thing that we can do, aside from supporting companies that add vegan options to their menus or to their product lines. Um, you know, I think that's the best, best step we can take. And if you had a message for the masses what would that be? What would you want to get out there to people? Uh, Well, the message that I would want to get out to the masses, which hopefully I'm going to be able to do through my book, is that food really is the solution, that what we eat can harm or heal the world, and that by choosing certain types of foods, namely plant-based foods, we can have a really big impact. You know, our world is getting bigger by the minute. Our population is growing. Our resources are shrinking. And if there's one thing that we could choose to do, to try to make the world a better place. It's to eat more plants and less meat. I wanted to ask you that if we didn't change anything and we continued status quo, people just kept eating the way they are and the planet kept going as it's going, what does the future of this planet look like and how much trouble are we in and how soon is that trouble going to be showing up? 
dire. The consequences will be dire. We've got to change the way that we're doing things. We've got to be learn how to do more with less if we want to survive. You know, you ask how soon. We'll, we'll just look at fish stocks in the ocean. You know, scientists now have reached a, a basic consensus around the idea that if we continue far, uh, if we continue fishing, you know, out in the ocean the way that we are today, there every single fishery in the world, commercial fishery, all the commercial fish stocks will have collapsed by 2048. That's not that far from now. That's in our lifetimes. Um, that's coming right, right, right around the corner when there may be no more fish in the sea, literally. And um, so, you know, we've got to just we've got to start making changes. We've got to start um, really, I think, eating in a way that ensures uh, the future survival of of all species on this planet in a healthy way. Yeah, and I think we're also feeling the impact of climate change already. I mean, it's almost that we're into May soon and, and it's still winter here, which is, is ridiculous. And the planet's in a lot of trouble. And this, this book really sheds a good light on a lot of important issues. And once again, Matthew Prescott's book is called Food is the Solution, What to Eat to Save the World. And it has over 80 recipes for a greener planet and a healthier you. And of course, we're going to link to it in our show notes at planttrainers.com. And Matt, is there anywhere that people can go to reach out to you if they wanted to connect with you? Yeah, um, my website is foodisthesolutionbook.com. Um, you can also go to matthewprescott.com. You can find me on Facebook or Twitter or wherever else on the internet that you might be looking. I'm, I'm probably there. And yeah, I, I love to hear from people. So by all means, friend me on Facebook, friend me on Instagram, send me a message. Um, go to my website, again, matthewprescott.com and hit me up with an email and uh, I'm all ears. Perfect. And we will link to all of those in the show notes at planttrainers.com. So if they can't remember, then they can get it there. Matt, it's really such a beautiful book on the outside, but the information that people will get from it on the inside is where the impact is really going to come. So thank you for writing it and for sharing it with everybody. Your knowledge is is spectacular. It's unbelievable. So we just wanted to thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, well, thank you guys for having me on. And thank you so much for everything that you're doing to put these messages out there and to help people eat in a better way. It's, um, you know, it's a team effort. And so I really appreciate everything you, you all are doing too. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much for listening to this edition of the Plant Trainers Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or any other podcast listening platforms. We appreciate the feedback we receive from you. Every time we get a five-star rating or review on iTunes from one of our fans, it ensures other people will find us too. Thanks to our patrons. To become a patron, visit www.patreon.com slash plant trainers. Even supporting us with $1 really makes a difference. Connect and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Plant Trainers. Like Plant Trainers on Facebook, join our newsletter, and check out our website at www.planttrainers.com for awesome plant-based recipes and a list of our services. Email your questions to info at planttrainers.com so we can answer them on our upcoming Facebook Lives. We hope we've inspired you today. Join us again next time and have a healthy day.